Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear scientists, doctoral candidates, students, dear colleagues. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to welcome you to the ninth International Excellence Talk of the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. This lecture series was initiated in May last year and is designed to provide a platform to discuss the current research topics of internationally renowned scientists in an interdisciplinary context. Before I welcome and introduce our guest today, I would also like to remind you of our first speaker, Professor Igor Komarov from the Kiev State University in the Ukraine. He opened a series of international excellence talks events almost one year ago and said in a video message about the International Excellence Fellow Program, this program is about happiness. Now he is in this family are in Kiev in a war zone in the middle of Europe. Our thoughts are today with him and his family and we hope that this attack will end soon and that the people of this country will not to have to suffer anymore. With great concern, we are following the current conflict in the Ukraine. Some of us may be affected directly if their families or friends are living in a war zone. Others have scientific or personal relations to Ukraine or Russia. At KIT, people from more than 120 countries, especially from Ukraine and Russia, are studying and working together to solve grand challenges facing humanity. Together with the science institutions in Germany, we are strongly committed to the principles of democracy, human rights, and peaceful coexistence. We are convinced that science can build bridges. Today, I'm very honored to introduce Professor Andrew Forbes, distinguished professor from the School of Physics at the University Whitewaters Round in South Africa, who was awarded the George Foster Award from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation for his outstanding contribution to photonics. And now I would like to hand over to Professor Dirk Wenzel, spokesperson of the Humboldt Regional Group, Karlsruhe Potsheim, for his opening remark. Here, Professor Wenzel, the screen is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear Humboldt fellows and Wallis, scientists, doctoral candidates and students, dear colleagues and dear friends. This time it's our great honor to welcome a member from the Humboldt family, Andrew Forbes. Therefore, I also would like to use the opportunity to thank Professor Jan Garrick Kovink from the Institute of Microstructure Technology at KIT for hosting Andrew and to offer him his hospitality during this day here in Karlsruhe. I also would like to thank to take the opportunity to encourage as many KIT scientists as possible to take the challenge to invite excellent scientists to KIT and to host them in their research group. Now, it's my pleasure to hand over to Jan Garrett Koving from the Institute of Microstructure Technology at KIT, who would like to introduce our speaker today, Andrew Forbes, as a host and give some additional remarks about Andrew and his research. Thanks a lot. I'm looking forward to your presentation. I must say here that I am extremely proud and um, I'm extremely happy that uh, um, Andrew is spending time in my laboratory and um, that he's actually managed to make it all the way to Germany as well. I have to say that I have become quite an admirer of, of Andrew and not only about his, um, his wonderful research work, but also the fascinating path that he has taken. And I will just grab a couple of um, items from his CV just to give you an idea uh, of how versatile and how productive he has been in his life. So he got a, um, a um, a, physics and P uh, a physics PhD from the University of Natal, but then um, spent uh, a number of years working uh, in a startup company. And uh, he helped really to build the startup company up to, yeah, I, I believe it was around about 70 people who worked there at the time when they sold it in 2011. So a huge success story of um, producing um, novel laser systems that was sold to the United States of America to a corporation there. So uh, a huge impact from his work. 
And at that point, he decided he wanted to go back to academia and he joined the South African National Laboratory, the CSIR, or the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, as it is known. And um, he joined the National Laser Center there, and he started quite a lot of activities there. The first one is really exemplary, and it, um, it's called the user facility. And the idea was really quite remarkable. Many South African university departments do not have um, the kind of cash you need to buy uh, the top state-of-the-art instruments. And Andrew instituted a system there which, um, which helped South Africans to own these laser systems and quasi rent them out, you could say, to the physics department so that the PhD students could still work with top instrumentation, which I thought was a, an absolutely brilliant idea because it really helped to push this whole uh, photonics business into the South African universities and has helped to establish them, uh, give them some leading corners, which I think is a, a, a really uh, a re remarkable step. So Andrew is of course well recognized for his contributions. He is uh, he has the level of um, fellow in the SBIE, which is one of the um, you know the top societies for. Um, uh, work in photonics and, and optics. And uh, he has him and uh, also his students, they have won very many awards, I believe over 70 awards, if that's not an outdated number that I have. Uh, so he's obviously maintaining a, a huge level of productivity and creativity. So Andrew and myself are collaborating on a jointly supervised PhD pro project. And I think that's a very nice opportunity to have um, some joint interests, of course. And um, already during the stay at IMT, a number of other interesting ideas have come up um, for which we are currently contemplating to perhaps initiate further uh, jointly supervised uh, PhD student projects. Uh, it's all uh, in, in flux at the moment, but uh, as you can see, it's definitely inspiring me and, uh, and I hope um, it's also uh, has the same effect on, on Andrew, of course. And so I can say with any, any, without any more talk today, um, and um, Andrew, the floor is yours. Jan, thank you very much for the very kind words. Um, it's, it's fantastic that you said all that. I'm at, within the School of Physics at Witts University. If the slide changed, you should see now a lot of trees. So it's in Johannesburg. It's an inner city university. Johannesburg is purported to be the largest man-made forest in the world. It's very beautiful in, in the spring when all the jacaranda trees bloom. This is the suburbs of Johannesburg but you have to come into the city center to find the university. If you do that, here it is. This is when the students are not around, as has been the case actually for the last couple of years. It's a Dutch name. So the W is pronounced with a V, it's Wits for short. And in fact, this year we celebrate our centenary. The university is 100 years old. And if you come a little bit to the left of this great hall, the School of Physics looks more or less identical. In fact, just a little bit smaller. And inside the School of Physics is my laboratory, and we play with structured lights. And what do I mean by structured lights? I mean, we try to tailor lights much like you would tailor cloth, trying to weave a pattern to the fabric of light itself. And we do this with not only bright classical light, like you may get from a laser pointer, but also with quantum light. And so those are the two essential features of this talk that I want to unpack a little bit. What do we mean by tailoring or structuring lights? And what do we mean by quantum light? So I'm going to give each slide a second or two to load just so that we don't have some strange delays, but you should be seeing a little animation of intensity structured light. And so what you see on your screen, hopefully, is a, a myriad of different patterns. These are experimental images created on a digital device, as Jan was speaking about earlier. And this is what we mean by structured light, tailoring light in all its degrees of freedom to give it some structure for some particular applications. And in this particular example, the structure is in the intensity of the light, how the light looks to the eye. Of course, we also want to do it with quantum light. <clears throat> so let me give you a short tutorial on quantum physics. 
And I really want to break quantum physics into very two broad categories. The first one pertains to almost 100 years ago in the first quantum revolution. And it was the foundations of a discrete energy levels, strange tunneling phenomena. It gave rise to practical technologies that we see and use every day, things like transistors, computers, lasers, none of this would be possible without quantum mechanics as a core theory. But this was the first quantum revolution. What's happening today is that we're experiencing a second quantum revolution. Why a second quantum revolution? Because we've gone from an understanding, if you see my cursor, of the very small to an understanding of another property that is embedded in this theory, and that is the concept of entanglement. I'm going to show you what I mean by that in a slide or two. And with this new harnessing of entanglement, we can start to drive science through to technologies, through to applications. And these applications are based on communications, metrology, computing, and of course, in today's talk, I'm going to speak about imaging. This is very much at the forefront of science everywhere in the world, including in Europe. You have billion dollar euro projects, flagship projects, driving quantum technology at a strategic level for the continent. In South Africa, we also have a strategy, much, much smaller funds, but of equal national importance. And so the second quantum revolution is about entanglements this weird, spooky action at a distance that Einstein so abhorred, now we want to try to use it for practical use. So if you have been paying attention to popular science sometime in your career, you almost certainly would have come across this popular science version of quantum physics and its property of entanglement, and that is Schrodinger's cat. And the cartoon version, as I show you on the slide, kind of depicts the story. And the story is that the cat is inside a box, you cannot see inside the box there's a poisoned vial that has a chance of being broken and killing the cats and a chance that nothing happens and there's a 50 50 probability and the question is what is the state of the cat now in the classical world our intuition would say well the cat is either dead or alive we just don't know because we can't see inside the box but in the quantum world the or is replaced with an and a plus sign. The cat can be dead and alive in the superposition of the two states simultaneously. And this is what we mean by entanglement. Entanglement is a way of describing a superposition that connects the systems. It's only when we measure the cat do we see which state it collapses into. Now, we're not allowed to play with cats in our labs. The, the animal curity people don't like it, so we play with photons. So in my lab, since I, I'm in a photonics lab, this would be a cartoon of how we set up a quantum entanglement experiment. But the two photons coming out can be correlated, they can be connected in some way. <clears throat> and if we engineer things properly, this connection can be at a quantum level and not just a classical level. So how would the connection work and how would you see that it's quantum? Well, here imagine as my, my photon coming into the crystal, and I have two particles going out, let's call them particle A and particle B. In my case, there'll be photons, particles of light, but there could be other particles as well. And the story is that I don't know the state of either particle. Let's say I make a measurement on particle A and see that it's a heads, a, a tails version of a coin. Well, then what happens is that particle B immediately collapses into the opposite states, the heads. But if, on the other hand, I measured particle A to be in a combination of heads and tails, which wouldn't be possible in the normal world, then particle B would also be in a combination of heads and tails. And so the property of entanglements, one way to think about it, is that not only do I have these many, many possibilities, all of them existing at the same time, but that as I change the property of one particle, the other particle correspondingly also changes, no matter how far apart they are. So that is the essence of entanglement. And why is this interesting or useful? Well, for example, quantum computers use entanglement as a resource. The idea is that if we can have multiple superpositions 
we can trace out all the solution spaces in parallel to find out which one eventually is going to be the answer. We don't need to correspond, we don't need to calculate a particular path as we go. And this, of course, is very useful for solving complex problems. And let me give you an illustration of a problem that on the face looks very simple, but in fact is rather difficult. Imagine I give you two numbers, these two numbers, and I ask you to take the product. Well, on your smartphone, you can solve that in seconds. And if you do that, you would get this answer. But imagine I give you the reverse problem. I give you the answer and I ask you to find the two numbers when multiplied together, return that number. Well, this is a much harder problem to solve. So easy to state, but very, very hard to solve. In fact, this is the basis of modern day encryption. If you're wondering, by the way, the answer is this. If you make the number very large, it can take a very long time to solve, longer than your online banking, and so the system is secure. But a quantum computer could solve this problem very, very fast. And it solves it because it can map out all the solutions simultaneously. It doesn't have a bit that's zero or one, it has a bit that's zero and one. And it's so you have this many, many operations simultaneously. Of course, the answer to this is quantum communication. Because if you change the property of one particle, you immediately change the property of the other. And this means that if somebody is eavesdropping or trying to break into your encryption system, you immediately get notified with a flag that something has changed in the quantum system. And the quantum network, which we used to talk about as the future, is already here. This little cartoon is actually only half a cartoon. It's Mysius, the Chinese quantum satellite that establishes a link over thousands of kilometers between adjacent cities. So the network is here. In today's talk, I want to talk about imaging. How can we use the strange property of entanglement to reimagine the properties of imaging? And to do that, I first want to take you back to how conventional imaging works. So here you see a picture. We use a camera, in fact, if you look at how we sell our smartphones these days, the billboards show very beautiful pictures. It's sold on its capacity as a camera more than a phone. So how does imaging really work? Why is it that the camera, whether it's your smartphone or the old fashioned fancy camera that you see here, why is it that it takes good photographs, images of objects? So of course the heart is the lens, the optics that make this happen. And in physics, we traditionally draw the object as an arrow, but you can imagine that replaced by a beautiful mountain or a lake or whatever you happen to be pointing your camera at. So why is it that we see an image on the other side of some object? And the reason is that the optical system sets up correlations between these two planes. So for example, if I look at how the light goes from the head of the arrow, it could follow this path down to the bottom. But it could also go through the lens that way, or it could go down through the bottom. In fact, it takes all the paths at once, but the salient point is that all the rays, no matter which path they take, they arrive at the same place at the same time. That's crucial. And this is what gives you a sharp image. If you don't have that right, you get a blurry image. But what establishes these correlations? What makes this possible? Well, it's the optical system itself. It's an engine, a man-made engineered system that establishes corresponding points on two different planes. So if I get those points correct, then you see I have a very sharp image, as you see here in the, in the picture of the camera. And if I don't get it correct, I have a very blurry image. And we're all very familiar with this in our everyday life. So what are the uh, assumptions that we make in this conventional picture of imaging? Well, the one is that the light had to travel from the object to the camera to form an image. That seems fairly obvious. You need light to interact with the object and come to your camera. <clears throat> the second is that if you take a beautiful photograph of some scenic uh, uh, scene, then obviously the number of pixels in the X and the Y direction, and your camera probably has uh, 2 million, or 4 million pixels, those pixels determine how clear or accurate the picture is going to be. So you have many, many pixels to resolve what the picture looks like. And what I want to do with my spooky quantum lights 
is get rid of both those cases. I don't want any light to travel from the object to the image, and I don't want to have any pixels. In fact, I'm only going to have one pixel. So what sort of image can I make with a single pixel camera where the light never leaves the object? That's what we want to know. So I'm going to go back to my lab. Here's my cartoon. I'm going to generate with my little crystal two entangled photons. So I know that they are going to be entangled. And what does that give me? Well, firstly, let me show you what it looks like in the lab. So here you see the incoming light to the crystal. And if you look very carefully, you can see the two beams of light going away. These are actually bright beams of light following the path of these photons. But this is physically what this experiment might look like. And just to give you an indication of what such an experiment costs, because I don't know if there's any members of the public in the audience, but scientists are always asking for money. And so I once was explaining to my student all the equipment that we had to put up for this experiment. And then he said to me, but what, what does this cost? And I gave him the value and then he said, what? He said, but you could have bought a Maserati with that. And we then we don't tend to think of it like that as scientists, but it's, it's a little bit actually depressing to think that we instead buy lasers and, and detectors rather than beautiful cars. So if you're wondering where your taxpayer's money goes to, it's all this fancy equipment to do these strange experiments. But let's go back to my little cartoon. I have two entangled photons coming out of this crystal. And what happens? Because they share these correlations, nature is giving me the correlations between the photons without the optics. So that means that the arrival of photons from each of the two arms, although they come randomly, they are position correlated because they are connected by this property of entanglement. So whatever happens to one affects the outcome of the other. And I can use this fact that they are position correlated to do imaging without all the fancy optics. So let's see how I might do that. So here I have my high energy photon coming to a crystal and now consider photon B. So one photon, imagine it's going to the right hand side of my room. And what am I going to do with it? I'm going to place an object into its path. This is going to be the thing I want to form an image of. Imagine that my photon goes and it passes through this object. I imagine I have a glass plate and a black pen and I simply block out where I don't want lights so that what I'm left with is a little ghost, as you see here. And then I'm going to have a bucket detector. And what do I mean by a bucket detector? I mean a detector that's much bigger than this object. And what is the consequence of that? It means that this photon has got no information about the object at all. Because if the photon gets through to the detector, it doesn't know anything about the object because the detector is much bigger. So photon B does not know anything about the object. What about the other photon? Well, the other photon I'm going to send to the opposite side of the room. You can imagine the opposite end of the universe. This is photon A. And I'm going to send it straight to a camera. Well, now I have photon A also has never seen the object. So it doesn't know anything about the object. So neither photon A nor photon B have any information about the object. And now I'm going to measure on the camera to see what I get. Now I still have a camera, so I still have all my pixels. I haven't removed anything about the dimensionality of the detector. But what I have removed so far is that there's no link between the object and the camera. There's no light moving from the object to the camera. Well, if I watch the camera, and hopefully you see this animation playing out, then as the photons arrive, although they're arriving randomly, when I watch what happens in, in connection with the other photon by measuring in coincidence, I start to see an image of the object. And this is called quantum ghost imaging. So on my camera, I have an image of an object, even though my photon never interacted with that object. And now what I'd like to do in the next step is get rid of all the pixels. So could I just do it with a single pixel? And to do that, I first have to know how pixels really work on a camera. And I don't mean from a technological perspective, I mean 
from a fundamental abstract perspective. What are the pixels really doing? And the way I like to think about it is like this. Imagine on the left here, I have my pixelated camera, like on your smartphone. There could be millions of pixels. And the way I'm going to think about it is that this little display is made up of, say, the top left pixel with some weighting, which says how much light arrives at the top left pixel, and then the bottom right pixel and how much light arrives at the bottom right pixel, and so on, so that I have in, in, a, a, a sum of all these terms where each term represents one pixel on the display. And that's quite instructive because it allows me to see something about how the camera works. The way it works is that the two pixels don't overlap at all. So if I look at the overlap between this pixel system here and this one over here, you see that when that one is on, there's nothing here. So anything times naught gives you naught. And likewise for the bottom pixel. So in other words, it forms, in the technical language, we'd call it an orthogonal set of these basis functions. And now I can ask a very simple question. If all I need is that there's no overlap so that the pixels don't get confused, why don't I change what I have to random pixels? Because if I have a random display of on-off pixels here and a different random display there, the overlap between two random functions, if, you, if they're truly random, is zero unless you have the same random function, in which case it's one. So this system should also behave like a camera by simply asking how much light arrives with this random pattern and C2 is how much light arrives with this random pattern. And if you add up the sum, you should get back to whatever your object is. And so now we're going to try that in the lab and so what we're going to do is, again, we have our two entangled photons, but now we're going to send them to these digital devices that you heard Jan speak about a bit earlier. On the one digital device, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to program the object. And on the other digital device, I'm going to program the random functions. And I'm going to let them change. And here I've changed the camera to a single pixel because the information is held now in the random functions, which are purely digital. They're sitting on my computer. And so I've taken away the complicated detector. I've had to sacrifice a little bit of digital technology, but now I have a very simple single pixel detector. So the question is, can you really form an image with just one pixel? So now let's run the experiments. And if you watch it as the random mass change, we can see the image on the right-hand side forming of the object, which is a lambda. This is the same ghost imaging experiment I showed you earlier, only this time there's no camera and the detector has a single pixel. And so now we have no resolution in the detector and we have no connection between the object and the image, but still it works. Now, at this point you might say, well, that's all very nice, but you know, it's cool physics, but there doesn't seem to be any advantage to going to the quantum world versus the classical world. You can do some cool stuff, but it's not better in any sense. Could you do something in the quantum world that you couldn't do in the classical world? And the answer is yes. So if you have a look at my little cartoon again, I have a photon coming into my crystal. I'm going to generate two entangled photons coming out. But this time you notice I've made the color of the two photons going out different. One I've made blue and the other one I've made in the infrared. You can think about it as this, that one photon is visible. You could see it with your eye and the other photon is invisible. You could not see it with your eye. So if I go back to my little uh, two-dimensional cartoon, now photon B, the photon that goes through the object, could be in a deep infrared wavelength. You know, when you watch science fiction movies and sometimes the, uh, the characters put on some goggles so they can see like these infrared pictures of, of people or heat seeking uh, objects. That's because you can't see the heat signal with your eye. The wavelength is too long, too far in the red. You need a very special detector to see that. 
But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass my infrared beam through the object, but I'm going to try to image it with a visible detector. It's like trying to see that heat pattern with your smartphone. So could you do it? Now, why would you want to do it? Firstly, let's ask that. So what I'm going to do to demonstrate this to you is I'm going to take an object that's the number four, and I'm going to put it behind some tinted glass. So if it's behind the tinted glass, of course, you cannot see the object. But the long wavelength, the infrared wavelength, can get through the tinted glass. So the question we're asking is, can we point our smartphone away from the car, but still see what's inside the car on the smartphone? And if we run the experiments, indeed, we can. And it works because the long wavelength photon goes through the tinted glass and it sees the object. The visible camera never sees the object. It doesn't have to interact at all. And it sees an image of this object. And of course, you can imagine that all of this lends itself to artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so in the bottom panel, you see that the raw data evolves very, very slowly, but this sort of machine learned image of the object uh, triggers very, very fast. And so we can enhance the camera to make it intelligent, to recognize objects, to stop the experiment as soon as a photon, as soon as we've recognized what it is. So we have very few photons involved in the experiment. And you can see why that would be useful in things like imaging light sensitive structures in the biological medical world or seeing past uh, otherwise uh, 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 non-transparent films, glass, tinted glass, for example, in defense and security, seeing things that would otherwise be invisible to normal detectors. So in my final example of how quirky this quantum world is, I want to show you this. Imagine that this time I have an object that's perhaps on a satellite here on the left, and I would like to form an image to the satellite here on the right. Now, obviously, if I connect between the two satellites, so I send a photon across, I can convey information about the object to the image. But what I want to do is I want to take that away and have an image of this object without any link at all. Now, previously, my two photons were entangled from the crystal. And so they had these natural position correlations from nature, from the, the property of entanglement. But now the photon over here is completely independent to the photon over there. So can I form an image of an object when the two photons have got no correlations at all? Well, obviously you can't do that, but what you can do is you can have a photon pair in satellite one and a photon pair in satellite two and take one photon from each pair together and combine them. If you combine these two photons, then the other two that were originally completely independent also become entangled. This is a property that we use for quantum teleportation. Very similar to the Star Trek idea of teleportation, except we can't teleport material objects yet but we can teleport quantum states. What do you need here? What sort of complicated physics do you need at this interaction point to make it possible to establish correlations between independent particles of light? It turns out you just need a cube of glass. Just a simple cube of glass would do it. Sometimes nature is kind to physicists. And when you do it, something very strange happens. And I, I use this example to end with the quirkiness of the quantum world. So imagine my object is the letter J, and I'm now going to form an image on this independent photon on the other side. What comes out is a contrast inverted image. Everything that was bright on the object becomes dark in the image, and everything that was dark in the object becomes bright in the image. And the reason this happens is that there are many subtleties that I haven't brought up in this talk, that entanglement comes in different flavors. And when you use this cube of glass, you get what we call an anti-symmetric flavor. 
and this gives you contrast inverted imaging. It's very strange that the symmetry, something that's very abstract in mathematics, can play a practical role in how the quantum world works in the imaging systems. And so this is some of the topics that we're presently trying to push, but it's very quirky that nature would give you the negative and not the photograph, as if we're going backwards rather than forwards in our technology. I imagine that there must be some students listening to this, and so allow me to end with a, a fun slide. <clears throat> you know, in the old days, we used to speak about becoming a mechanic. The world needed mechanics. And my message to the students is that we do need mechanics still today, but what we need are quantum mechanics. The future is quantum technology in all spheres of science. It will have its, its, its touch felt to some degree or other. And so if you're pursuing science, don't, dis, don't disregard the importance of quantum. It's not abstract textbook physics. It's really driving very fast from science through technology to real world applications. I say no understanding needed because although I've tried to paint a picture here of a tutorial style talk that is uh, fairly transparent, I don't claim to understand why nature really works the way it does. I still find it very surprising. My students don't, but I, but I do. They say, oh, but this is what the theory predicts. I agree, but it's still amazing that nature works that way. So that leads me to thank my group. All the wonderful experimental results you've seen are taken by my students and all our funders. And I want to take this opportunity to thank the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, not just for, for financial support, but actually for holistic support. It's really been a fantastic experience. The workshops and seminars and online events and all of my engagement has been absolutely fantastic and I'm thrilled to be associated with them. Uh, KIT, where I'm based at the moment, fantastic institute, wonderful people, and Jan's Institute IMT is really an eye-opener for me to see what you can do in structural materials and, and taking it forward in excellent technologies. So thanks very much to, to all the support that these institutes have given me. And I think on that note, it's important that I point out that everything I've told you, of course, has been fairly parochial, but uh, ghost imaging is a highly vibrant field. It's been around for about 20 years. There are wonderful pioneers in this field. And uh, here's a wonderful, if you just Google ghost imaging, you'll find a wonderful tutorial article by Miles Padgett. And on that note, I'd like to thank Miles and Jonathan. They're longtime collaborators of mine on this. Miles runs a quantum hub in Glasgow on quantum imaging. He is the, I would say, the undisputed leader in the world on that topic. And uh, we, we have a very fruitful collaboration with him and Jonathan Leach on this topic. Uh, and that brings me to the end of the talk. I, I hope it's not been too much physics for the non-physicists in the audience. And uh, I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me here and for listening this evening.